Anyway, but I got to tell you, man, I, I'm going to roar into this because we had a lot to talk about, and I want to uh, allow some time for some uh, back and forth dialogues. But I got a, a, a lot to kind of download. I'm going to try and make it a little bit cogent, but a lot to discuss um, because I'm, I'm wildly interested in futurism. I, I'm excited to follow Brian's comment yesterday because what, what many of us are interested in are, are trends and probability. You, while you cannot predict the future, if you really get your head around probability, you can begin to prepare. But I really want to begin by going back um, because it's very important to understand kind of where we're coming from because I think it, it helps us as a, as a group, as a sector, understand some of the limitations that are not of our making. I oftentimes hear us beating ourselves up for things that the way we are funded will not allow us to achieve, and we're going to get there. But today, as many of you all know, is the 70th anniversary of D-Day, you know? And that's a really big deal um, because, uh, well, I don't want to get too much into metaphors. What we're talking about today is, to a certain extent, a kind of a nonprofit Normandy, the sense of how will we move forward together with a, a great sense of purpose. Um, but I wanted to go back because it's very important to understand that, that when World War II ended, America, our industrial base, was completely intact. And our farming system was the best the world had ever seen. And this is particularly germane here in California where this amazing combination, and it's still so modern, we take it so for granted, but this amazing confluence of immigration, transportation, refrigeration, and irrigation basically made it feasible for someone in the dead of winter in Montana to get a lemon or a lime, and that was a miracle. But our society that we fed the world and we rebuilt the world, and that produced an amazing abundance. And it allowed the nonprofit sector to grow exponentially in this country. Our society produced an abundance of things, and that allowed kind of this era of extra to fund our work. This is very important to understand because we get the extra. We have built an entire network, the third biggest employer in America, out of what's left over in our country. We get the extra buildings. You know, we get the extra clothes. We get people's extra time. We get extra money. We don't get uh, the upfront money. We get the extra money. What's deemed left at the end of the year, we get that. And regardless of that, we've been able to build a rather substantial infrastructure. And we're going to get to that. But what I really wanted to talk about is where I think some of the, the norms that I believe limit us originated from. Now, in the 19, early 1960s, women were only about 21% of the workforce, and there were about 65,000 nonprofit organizations. It was a pretty static number, and these were basically some of the groups that we've all known have been around, the Salvation Army, um, the, Red, the Red Feather, or the Community Chest, which became the United Ways, the Central Union Missions, the Girl Scouts. These are things that were pretty constant, but there was an explosion in the late 70s, in the, in the 19, uh, late 60s, early 70s. And it's the theory I've been working on that uh, it, this was driven very much by my mother's generation, a college-educated woman who in the 1970s, because she wanted to work or because the economy changed and women had to work. Nonetheless, what I believe happened is a significant number of these women came into the modern workforce and were told unceremoniously, you don't have any skills. You're a mother. You're a housewife. You can do charity. And suddenly, again, in almost 15 years, women became almost 50% of the workforce, and nonprofits grew to almost 1.3 million organizations. So what you have here is a feminized sector. The larger society, the dormant or the dominant economic culture views the work we do is nice, but not necessary. And the economic sexism that is the foundation system, the grant system, is designed to keep us anemic and fighting each other. In effect, think about that. This founding generation of women who came pouring into the sector with amazing visions. They watched on the sidelines as civil rights, the women's movement, Central Valley farm workers being organized, the environmental movement. They internalized and came in wanting to be part of a new America. They wanted to be part of making change. But when they went to the foundation community at that time, which was primarily white men giving away other white men's money. They were told unceremoniously, as long as you're doing benign charity, you'll get a grant. But the 60s have passed. We're not doing politics. 
and we're not doing economics. As long as you feed poor people leftover food from restaurants, man, we'll get along famously. In fact, we'll give you a little prize every once in a while. But we're going to keep you on a very short leash. We're never going to give you enough money to be economically independent, nor are we going to allow you to organize enough politically to challenge the system that makes the money we're now giving you a few crumbs left over from. And that was where we were built. And I want to be wildly respectful of the founding mothers who pioneered this movement. But what we're talking about now is how do we move forward? How do we grab a hold of what is not only rightfully ours, but what will make America a more just and a more powerful place. The number we talked about, 250,000 employees. Do you know how many people just voted in this state for the governor? Brothers and sisters, I'd laugh too, but the reality is we could elect a mayor. The nonprofits of this city, if you got organized, imagine a person who showed up. Now, I love our mayor. You know, when I first came here, in fact, I was honored to vote for the first time in California, a state where I guarantee you I'm going to rest when I die. But the point is, I was honored to vote. But when I first came here last year, I was really excited to see the campaign. And I was actually really excited to see the Southern California grant makers organize a kind of gathering of candidates to talk about their vision for the sector that, to be honest with you, I have not seen in many other cities. And virtually all of the candidates had a keen understanding about the role we play. Yet, do we have the kind of relationship with City Hall that we deserve, given the fact that we are major sources of outside money coming in to the city? Don't forget, there are no Fortune 500 companies based in Los Angeles, which means LACMA, which means Kaiser, which means UCLA and USC, all nonprofits. How much money do they bring in from outside this city in? How many people do we employ? How many payroll taxes, how much payroll taxes do we pay? And more importantly, and this is common to all of us, and this is really very much at, at the core of my way of thinking, there is no profit without nonprofits. And that's a, that, is a, that isn't a slogan, brothers and sisters. That's a hardcore economic fact. You can't make money nor run a city without arts and culture, without communities of faith, without education, without health care, you know, without beautiful, clean uh, environment and parks and rec. That's what we do. And the fact that still to this day we are viewed as the extra, the nice but not necessary, versus dynamic partners in the economic rebuild of not just Los Angeles and California, but this country. That must change. But the point is we must be prepared to change that. No one's going to magically ride into town and say, hey, nonprofits, let's, let's all usher in a new era. We have to, again, not be belligerent or rude, but understand we have a role to play. Now, this is a very exciting week because after an amazing nine months of building and meeting people and partnering, we launched our first pilot training program on Wednesday. The LA Kitchen, partnering with St. Vincent Meals on Wheels, was excited to uh, welcome 12 men and women, half young men and women aging out of foster care, half older men and women coming home from prison. This purposeful intergenerational peer mentoring program saying in effect can older men and women coming home as much as our society marginalizes older men and women coming back from prison can they serve as role models and help younger men and women who statistically are on that road can they say in effect I just got home after 30 years and I'm not going to let you take make the same mistake I did and can a younger person again I appreciate that I like working what's already here, what exists, and how can you use it differently. And so all of my businesses have been built around the idea of I take food, our society throws away. And in this case, in California, of, of the 40% of the food we, we throw away every single day, it, it's really staggering. 40% of the food we produce every single day in America is wasted. Half of that is fruits and vegetables that is primarily thrown away because it's cosmetically imperfect or for a variety of different reasons too expensive to bring to market. So California is an amazing spot to build a, a large-scale vegetable and fruit reprocessing center. And I love working with men and women that our society under values. Again, men and women who are homeless, men and women who are addicts coming home from prison. Um, but I also like social enterprise, the idea of making our own money. And I'll get into that, but I really wanted to bring that up primarily because I am so amazingly grateful to this city for the reception I've received and the warm welcome. And that is so exemplified by our relationship 
with St. Vincent Meals on Wheels. I don't know how many of you all know Sister or Sister Alice, Sam, as she is lovingly referred to by so many people. 35 years she's been leading the Meals on Wheels. And here I come waltzing into town, saying, in effect, I want to come in here and be part of a new era in which we prepare very, very healthy meals for a rapidly aging Los Angeles. Now, she could have easily said, don't let the door hit you on the way out, Junior. You know, <laughs> oh, we all know people like that, you know. And that's one of the things I'm most curious about. How do I avoid, how do all of us avoid becoming the leader none of us ever wanted to be? As I say many times, no one wakes up when they're 20 and looks in the mirror and says, man, when I grow up, I want to be a boring nonprofit leader who stifles innovation. <laughs> you know? And no one sees that when they look in the mirror. But the point is, how do you avoid that? And I look at Sister, again, who has done the exact opposite. You know, she opened up her doors and said, while you're building your kitchen, why don't you use ours? Why don't we share our kitchen? I believe so much in what you're doing, and I so much want to be part of working with you, I'll share my kitchen with you. Man, that's who I want to be when I grow up. I mean, I'm just mesmerized by it. But that exemplifies the spirit of Los Angeles. And I know sometimes, for those of you who have lived and worked here for many, many years, and props, my handsome brother, for 40 years in the saddle. And make no mistake, you know, when we, when we did that stand-up, it wasn't that we led organizations. What's equally important is we made payroll for 40 years. You know, and that's what makes me the happiest. You know, man, we are businesses. That's the thing I'm most proud of. I have never missed a payroll, you know, in 26 years. Now, like all of you, I have sweated payrolls. You know, I have, I have woken up, and in fact, I'm back. I'm, I, as, a, as a new, again, a, I'm starting up a brand new organization, and I have been reminded as I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning saying, damn, where am I going to, how am I going to make payroll? I'm back in that place that, that many of us think, oh, you reach a certain stage, you're out of it. This is the loop we're in, and this is what... We, are, we aren't that different from a significant amount of our brothers and sisters in the for-profit world. They have to wake up every day. I don't know how many of you all work with restaurateurs, but I've worked with thousands who on Thursday say, man, if I don't have a good weekend, it's all over. Everybody struggles in this country, but I, I must admit, we struggle so mightily to continue the work we do. And it, again, what the work we do is so essential now, but let's talk a little about this, because many of us are stretched thin right now. We are stretched thin. You know, making, again, I, I do want to emphasize, just making payroll, keeping the lights on, keeping the basic services continuing while the line of people who need our help gets longer and longer and longer. And this is the new American economy. Make no mistake, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the post-war economy put America way out in front. And we grew understandably to think this was somehow ordained. Well, the reality is the rest of the world has caught up, and rightly so. They have their children, they have their future, and they want the same things we want for our children and our cities, and they're fighting to get those. So this is a new American economy that we, must have, we have to adjust to. Now, that presents us with a lot of difficulties, but what amazing opportunities we have. If we look very, very hard at the community we have and the resources that we maybe have historically used in a certain order or a certain tradition, but maybe, just maybe they offer a tremendous opportunity to break through and go to a new era. And let's talk about demographics for a second. Los Angeles is going through significant changes. You know, that's why I really wanted to talk about is your old nonprofit ready for a new Los Angeles? Because this city is changing every single day. I've been doing business here for many, many years. And over the years as I came and I watched the community, I used to just watch sunset. You could really watch as the, as the businesses from Silver Lake to Echo Park, and then down into the downtown, and what's about to reverberate and roll up into East LA. I just watched what has been called gentrification, and a variety of words roar across this city. Now, the reality is, there are almost 100 million people under 30 in America. This is the biggest, most diverse, most technologically advanced generation in the history of the world. And what's more important, they have been raised doing service. I say this all the time, man. I, I didn't go to, to college, but thanks to the power of the commencement address, you're looking at Dr. 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 Egger. <laughs> God bless America. But I tell you, I've done this experiment a couple of times, and, and, and take my word for it, or if you get the opportunity, do it yourself. But if you're ever in an opportunity to speak to a freshman class at any university, ask them, show of hands, how many of you all have done service before? 
And I guarantee you, 100% of those hands will go up. And they're roaring into LA, roaring into our sector with all kinds of amazing new ideas about philanthropy. What's the role of citizenship? How can the way I live my life, how can the way I make my money become my philanthropy, not just the check at the end of the year? That's a very powerful new idea, and I really want to emphasize that it's not going to be the check at the end of the year part, because we've built our entire economy on that check, and it's going to go away. As the boomers age out, a new generation is going to come in with very, very different ideas about how they use their money, how they use their time. And the smartest organizations now will begin to adapt and more importantly, reach out to those younger leaders within your organizations and allow them an ama to, to have a role in defining um, your organization's future. I wrote just this week, or I was, did an interview this week in which I challenged, um, and I think it was reinforced, the idea of the um, leadership um, back, uh, uh, the leadership challenge we have. There's, there's 10,000, there's thousands and thousands of Generation Ys, Xers, and Millennials who are more than thrilled to be able to jump into the driver's seat. The reality is because of the nefarious notion that low administrative overhead determines which organization is best, what we've never been able to do is create the kind of retirement accounts that allow our dynamic leaders to step aside. So what we must begin to explore, the reality is what we have is a generation of people who can't afford to leave, period. You know, so what we must begin to, to teach and discuss is the idea of shared leadership. How does a leader who might not be able to retire let go of the reins completely and allow a diffused kind of leadership to take hold? So that rather than them being the gatekeeper and the sole decision maker, they recognize that while I know I want to stay and I want to be part of this organization's future, I don't necessarily have to control every aspect. Just this week or just last week, as part of my own personal experiment, um, we had the CEO evaluation in our organization, which, by the way, was anonymous to allow people to be very, very honest. You know, and a good CEO, man, it isn't easy, but a good CEO takes his licks, learns, listens, and moves forward. But I urge you older leaders to consider how can you tap into the amazing reservoir of new ideas, exciting ways to, to, to reevaluate some of the metrics you have. You know, oftentimes we've been raised to sell our product in, in what we did that was good as opposed to how did we save this city money? How did we make money for Los Angeles? How much money did we bring in? And I think those young men and women can not only help us reevaluate our metrics, but also potentially help us um, tell, uh, tell our story better through the powerful work of new media. But I also want to speak about as much as this city is changing by so many young people coming here, and again, like me, drawn because of the creative culture that is Los Angeles. People come here specifically because not only is there work here, but this is one of those rare towns where people don't scoff at a new idea. You know, when I came here, in a, in a lot of other cities, people would, would look at the laundry list of things that I want to do. You know, even though I have a lot of experience, they would look at that and say, oh, man, that's too much. You can't do that. You know what I love about L.A.? People are like, right on, dude. Go for it. You know, they're like, man, good luck. If you can raise the money, right on. But more to the point, there's, a, there's always, I mean, to a saint, to a person, I look around the room, and I see people like my friend Rick. I see I, Becky was here yesterday, I know. I see Rachel. I see so many people I know who, I, who have said, how can we partner? But I also am wildly interested in the baby boomers because every single morning, 10,000 people wake up 67. <laughs> every single morning. And that's going to go on for the next 20-some years. You know, and I, I, use it, I tell this all, say this all the time, but, man, it's a wonder. You can't put your head out the window here, sigh every morning. It's 10,000 people look in the mirror. But you know what they're sighing? They're saying, how did I get so lost? How did I get so tricked into thinking if I just bought more junk, I'd be happy? And I don't know about you, but I see them every day pouring into the nonprofit sector saying, use me. Use me. This is the deepest well of life experience in the history of the world. The way we have to learn to um, value our elders in this country is a huge, important thing, and we can lead. You know, whether it's through the volunteer experience, one of the most economically essential things for Los Angeles and for America is that our older citizens stay, live independently as long as possible, but stay productive as long as possible, and that's volunteerism. So for us to throw open our doors, not just to paint the walls again, but to really say, you've been a CEO, you've been a, you've been a thousand other different careers, come in here and help us. 
take our organization to the next level. I've spoken way longer than I wanted to, and I see actually each clock is different. I see 10 of <laughs> and 20 of. So 10 minutes. So I'm going to open it up. I apologize. I just had so much I wanted to say, and I could probably go on for another half an hour, but I did want to open it up. Is, is there any thoughts or questions? I, I apologize. Yes, sir, my handsome brother. I'm just, just calling like I see it, man. We bring in money. Uh, we, you got it. We, we bring in money. Uh, we employ people. And basically, they would say, you know, my question is, is there any research or are there any tools in which I can actually demonstrate the economic impact in my community? Hey, I'd be happy to talk with you anytime. I think every single university has, is loaded with students who are taking nonprofit management courses or social enterprise. In fact, just this afternoon, I'm going off to keynote the UCLA social enterprise competition um, this afternoon. So again, I guarantee you there's an army of young people that can help you make that case. But I think, and I know Jan Masioka, if, she, if she's not here, she will be. Um, Jan, who runs CAN, the California Associated Nonprofits, again, one of my favorite leaders because she is pushing back on this idea of our role in advocacy. We have been told unceremoniously that rich people and corporations have First Amendment rights to be politically active, but we've been told unceremoniously, shut up and feed the poor. We can't be active, and I think Jan is one of those fearless leaders that I love to work with and follow, but I think she's been talking, and I think the future is how do we elect people? How do we fundamentally elect mayors who show up on day one, day one, you know, saying in effect, not only do I understand what you do, you know, but I'm gonna appoint somebody, a dedicated point person, and this is the thing I'm really an advocate for, the idea of, a, of, of, of an office of strategic partnership, and I know the previous mayor and the current mayor have such an office, but I don't think they've used it to their full advantage. There are cities like Denver where they've been able to bring $70 million into the city from out with a staff of three people in their Office of Strategic Partnership, but good data on the sector so that laws and policies aren't enacted that sound good and feel good, but they're based on an antidotal understanding of what we do. So again, good data, double the number of money coming in, contracts, how can we do more contracts? I've said, I was on the stage two weeks ago talking to um, the Aging Association of Aging Organizations saying, in effect, I long to be your number one nutrition partner uh, in feeding older Angelinos. You know, but what we have to do when we're doing contracts, you know, the thing is how do, we, how do we get cities to understand that we could be dynamic contractors who could also employ people who might be costing the city a lot of money if they were homeless or addicted or going back to prison, but how do they streamline the reimbursement process so we don't go, get, go broke waiting to get paid for the services we did? You know, I'm also a big believer in um, social enterprise and microcredit. What are the policies that could be introduced at the city council level that would help to spur the growth of social enterprise? But more importantly, volunteerism. You may know that Governor Schwarzenegger was the first governor in America to appoint a volunteer coordinator to the cabinet. You know, and again, that was pretty smart. And again, I, that's the kind of thing I'm after. But that, I believe, electing people like that will make our job easier. But that, it, that demands us being involved in the political process, not sitting outside because they told us we can't. Yes, my beautiful sister. I'm Linda Reinstein, the co-founder of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. And thank you very much for your I inspirational speech. My question to you is, wh wh how are you using new media? Because we're in a room filled with brilliant leaders and innovators. And I think that it's undertapped within our community. And I'm hearing from my colleagues here that they want to learn more from the center. How, what are your three top recommendations that you'd like to impart on us about social media and new media? Twitter is, is a, is a walkie-talkie to God. Twitter is an amazing resource. No, I, I'm wildly serious. Now, now, get your head around this. We've been told we can't be involved in political politics, right? And we've been told if we go to work and use our, our computers, our phones, our letterhead, we can lose our 501c3. You can go onto Twitter, and you can have an account where you can self-identify as a nonprofit leader, but this is my personal opinion. And that allows us to organize the 14 million people who work in nonprofits in a way that candidates cannot ignore because they have a, they, I guarantee you, they have a staff person whose their only job is to monitor that. And imagine if somebody running for mayor or governor every day, 10, 1,000, 10,000 people tweeted one thing, we're a major employer in this city, how are you gonna partner us, with us to create more jobs, period. You know, they can't ignore us and that's a powerful tool. I think YouTube and the power of visuals allows us not only to tell our story, but sometimes can allow us 
to give the people who we serve the ability to tell their story better. And I think if I can riff on that for one second, we have passed the era in which we can merely serve clients. You know, we came up at a time when we perceived our job is to serve. Our job, brothers and sisters, is to empower. Our job is we have to create jobs. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, every couple of years, puts out their projections of the jobs of the future. The number one job projected over the next 20 years is home health care aid. Do you know how much it pays? $19,500. Now, the reality is we can either accept that as a sector, you know, and shake our heads, or we can say, in effect, you know what? Why don't we create those jobs? There's no reason why we can't create those jobs, because if we don't create those jobs and rededicate ourselves to paying a good wage and retirement accounts, because, again, our profit, our motivation isn't that kind of Milton Friedman idea that we want to make a whole bunch of money and squirrel it away and take it out of town or put it in our own pockets. Our vision and what makes us such a powerful potential partner for mayors in this, in this country is that we invest, re reinvest profit over and over and over again. The money doesn't leave town. You know, so for us to create those jobs, that's very much a part of the future, and it's very much what I'm dedicated to at the LA Kitchen. If I'm going to commit to training older men and women who are coming home from prison, younger men and women I can find jobs for, but older men and women coming home from prison, if you're over 50, good luck. If you're over 50 and you've got a felony conviction, no jobs. So I can't not create those jobs. But it's not enough just to pay somebody a living wage, even though all my businesses have always started people at $13 an hour with full benefits. That's just not enough because I know intellectually those men and women have spent their earning years behind bars. So I cannot start a business designed to feed older men and women who do not have enough money in the bank by creating another generation of old poor people in the process. So the business we're starting, Strong Food, will be a profit-sharing business. The idea that when you work here, a part of the action will go into a retirement account. So when you reach the point where you can't work, you'll have something to land on. But this is the way we think, and this is the kind of business that I'm a little bit ahead of and I'm happy to share, you know, but the point is there's a lot of great information out there. Um, and I, just one thing before I go forward, man, I, I, I'm doing two speeches today, but I'm not doing it because I like the sound of my own voice. I'm doing it because I don't work unless you work. You know, I don't succeed unless you succeed. I have a vested interest in you all thriving as a sector. You know, I do not want to fight with you for money. It's not my program over here. It's not arts versus AIDS. It's not old versus young. We have to reach that point where we commit to one another. I will not fight with you for money anymore. There's enough in America for all of us to be funded, and America won't work unless we work. So again, I just want to reemphasize that. One more question. One more question, one more comment. Yes, boy, we got a packed in the middle here. Yes, sir. We knew where to sit. <laughs> I'm just grateful to the uh, Center for uh, inviting you and giving me a chance to hear you for the first time. I'm one of those 10,000 who earlier this week uh, crossed into the uh, 67 range, and I object. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be called a senior citizen. That's right. the one. No. I, what I, you hit a very important point, which is that the for-profit world gets involved in politics, and for whatever reason, we have been told that we're not supposed to. And as organizations, we're legally not supposed to. But it has also uh, sent a bad message that we shouldn't, as individuals, get involved in politics. Right. And I think that uh, from what you're saying, and for those of us here in this room, we have to start looking at how do we organize as individuals. We happen to work in the nonprofit sector, but we as individuals have to become a stronger political unity, a, a stronger force, so that we can speak to elected official or to candidates and make sure that they are embracing our agenda and not just embracing it when they're running, but embracing it after they get elected to office. And I would just encourage somebody else to take on the leadership, because I say yes too often. What's your, what's your name? I'm not going to give it away. I'm Michael, <laughs> Alexander. <laughs> Michael Alexander. Okay. With grand performances. Real quick, um, and as, as, ways to, as a way to close, and again, thank you very much. I've said this a few times. If Michael and I each had competing dry cleaners right across an Alameda Street, every morning I'd drive down Spring hoping that when it turned into Alameda, I'd see, I'd see fire trucks trying to put out Michael's dry cleaner, and I would be thrilled. Yay, finally, Michael's burned down. But the reality is, if somebody wanted to come in and regulate small business in a way that affected Michael and mine ability to make profit, we may not drive down to City Hall together, but the reality is we would find our way to the Chamber of Commerce 
and we would put aside our differences strategically at that moment to work together so that we could each survive to fight another day. The nonprofit sector needs to get to that point. I think we get scared by the politics. We're allowed to be involved right in on. government. Right on. Right? We're allowed to inform and we're allowed to educate. And we didn't have to give that up. Nah. <laughs> no, man, I'm like George. I don't know if you, George Clooney got asked once why he wouldn't run for office. He's like, I'm the guy who drank the bong water at the party. So uh, anyway, um, but make no mistake, make no mistake. Till my dying breath, I am here to rock Los Angeles and be a great partner. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>